It's afternoon, February 24th. We're at Five Mammoth Drive, speaking with uh, Agnes Shue Brafson, grew up in Deans, and Charles Weber, her neighbor. So they're going to share their memories of South Brunswick and Deans uh, with us this afternoon. Would you like to start, Agnes? Yes, I would. Uh, welcome to my home. Um, I was born and brought up in Deans in 1919. My mother and father came from Brooklyn. My father came to Deans um, as a child first, but then as a teenager, he came out and lived on the farms and farmed it while the rest of the family went back to Brooklyn. My grandfather bought these farms in 1904, 1906, I believe. He bought two of them, and the Terhune family were the tenant farmers after my grandfather bought them. Um, my mother and father, John and Mary Shue. An interesting point, my mother and my husband's mother were both Mary Ryans before they were married. So, and my mother investigated, we were not related. <laughs> <laughs> um, my grandparents, my father's father came from Baden, Germany. He came over here in 1865. My grandmother, Shu, was a German, but she was born here. My mother's parents came from Ireland. My grandmother came from Tipperary, but I'm sorry, I don't know where my grandpa came from. But he was a grand old man. He reminded me very much of George's grandfather, Ryan. Uh, I have a brother who lives in Maryland now, and a sister who lives in Monroe. Her husband was former mayor of Monroe for many years. Um, my memories of Dean's are my most vivid ones and most pleasant ones are living on the farm. We lived in a 13 room house. It became 13 rooms after I was married, after I was born. The year I was born, they put rooms on. I don't know if I was that big or not. But anyway, um, a Mr. Morell, whose name is probably going to come up here in, in Dean's history. Yes, it has. He built the addition onto the house. And by the way, also a connection, Charlie's grandmother was the midwife when I was born. And she made the statement where she carried me around, so my mother tells me, that she would dance at my wedding. And she did. <laughs> Very good. I made her do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the location of the farm? It was um, Dean's Road Hall Road, I believe is the name today. Right. Used to call it Shoes Lane, didn't they, Charlie? For a while. Well, we Maybe just that was called, before. We just called because it Road Road there were so time. few people lived on it. Yeah. And um, it's the only landmark I can tell you now is the Amato Nurseries. Right. Are kind of in the center of the farm. Well, on the east side of, um, of Route 130. Well, it's, it's divided. Yeah. Yeah. The new 130 went right through the farms. The old 130 used to run right in front of the house where we like, moved later. Um, let me see my notes here. It actually was the first farm past the brook. Lawrence Brook. Wasn't that Lawrence Brook? Well, that's, yeah, part of Lawrence yeah. Brook. Right. It was the first one going up the hill on the left. And what, uh, mentioning Lawrence Brook, uh, along about 19... Uh, 1930 maybe they replaced the old wooden bridge with the concrete bridge which has again been replaced and we and my brother and I were the only kids that lived the other side of the brook so the contractor built like a rope bridge for us to cross over to go to school because otherwise we would have gone all the way to Dayton or all the way to Davis and Mills. Mm -hmm. And my brother used to tease me when I get in the middle, he'd shake it. <laughs> that was the way it went. Um, 
because we had no heat, no central heat, we had no electric, we had an outhouse, we had a bathroom in the house, but we only used that in the summertime, in the wintertime. Um, most of the memories I remember going with my father to uh, the Werner um, Mill, which was down where, um, what are they calling it? It's a park down there now in Davison Mill. Davison Mill. Davison Davison Mill Park. Davison Mill yeah. Park. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where the mill was, and I used to love to go there. Old Mr. Werner would come out with his white apron and all dusty from, from uh, doing the wheat in the corn or whatever he took there to be ground up. Went to Old Dean's school. It was only two rooms. Again, it was heated by a pot belly stove, which Miss Bowman used to come and start up in the morning. Uh, I only ever had two teachers all the way through grammar school, Miss Bowman and Miss Pittman. And they, of course, your first teacher is always your favorite, and I, she's always been my favorite. Um, I remember in school, you never went to the old school, did you, John? No, I didn't. It's what was located where I was. Miss Bowman was my first teacher. Yeah, she taught for a long time. When I was in the other school. The old school, it was down. Now, which is now kind of the point between Old George's Road and 130. It's converted into a house, apartments out of the hospital. Um, I remember if you were really good in school, you got a chance to take the pail, and two students would go and walk up to Ed Newman's and get the water, and bring it back and pour it in a crock in the corner, and I've been racking my brain. I can't remember whether it was a ladle that everybody drank out of <laughs> or what. But I can still see that crock in the, in the corner of the room. How many were in your classes? Uh, I don't know as we went along, but in graduating from eighth grade, there were nine of us. Four girls and five boys. Do you remember their names? It was Mary and Zetta, Elsie Eidnesi, Lena, Beatrice Fessa, and myself. I was the only girl that went on to high school. Uh, Gerald Priest, who was a veterinarian. Max Horlick, who I understand is now some kind of a big shot in Washington. He's the only boy that is surviving. I don't know about the girls. I know Mary's alive, I know Lena's alive, and I'm alive. I don't know about Elsie. Uh, Freddie Bischoff, who died quite young, quite soon after we got out of high school. Uh, Al Reichler. I think he was he was a mayor of South Brunswick at one time, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. The young, the son was? Yeah. I didn't know that. He was on the committee. Now I, I don't remember if he was a mayor or not. I remember his dad was mayor for how many years? Oh, a long time. Mm -hmm. The park is named after. And Eddie right. Carmichael. Now Eddie Carmichael died just a few years ago. And they were the no, they were graduated. Now the new school in Deans. I don't know how many people know the story of how that started, but. My brother got very sick in school, and um, that was about 1925, I would say. And my mother, well, to make the story short but to the point, on Christmas Day the doctor told my father, take him down to see the tree because he's not going to rip the nut. But he did. That infuriated my mother to think that her son got so sick in school. The reason, I believe, was because the stove was not operating. So she got on her little Irish horse, and <laughs> she went to a member of the Board of Education, and he told her, if you don't like it, take him out of school. Well, that made her matter yet. 
doing something about the school situation. And she looked into, she had a meeting of, of parents, and she looked in, they looked into forming a PTA. And they did, and they signed petitions, and they got all their stuff together. And that's how Dean's School came to be built. However, at the time, the Board of Education said, if Dean's gets one, Dayton gets one. And I think that was because most of the members of the board were from Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the story of how Dean's School got started. And we moved from Dean's School, uh, I was just reading some old papers I have in there, in December. And we went to school one morning and Ms. Pittner said, everybody clean out your desks. No one wondered why. We marched from the old school to the new school with all our books in our hand. And that's how we got it. It's a way to move. <laughs> <laughs> there was no, you know, <laughs> fancy vans or parents doing it, we marched. And Miss Pittner was a fiend on keeping that school clean. If you touched the wall and put fingerprints on it, <laughs> you washed them all. She, she was a, a charmer, let me tell you. Uh, let's see. For school lunch in Dean's. When you go to Dean's school, Mrs. Anderson used to make soup. Oh, Mrs. Anderson, who was a Swedish lady, I believe, mm -hmm. um, she'd make these big pots of soup and carry them up the road, and for five cents you got a bowl of soup and a piece of bread or crackers or whatever it was. So that was the f first school lunch in Dean's. Um, in 1930, because of the Depression, the farmers were not faring too well. We moved from the homestead to be housed on the corner of George's Road and Beans Road Hall Road. It is now an office building. And that was also a joy living there. It was an old house, real old, and big rooms. And, uh, it was just a meeting place for all the kids. We had many parties in that one. My brother and I went to high school. And if you remember, when you ride by there, there was a big bay window in the front. Well, that used to be the Dean's Post Office. The big room in where that is part of was a general store at one time. The Gillens lived there, and that's where my parents were place from. There used to be a bakery in Dean's. Old Mr. Gemelch had a bakery on the opposite corner. Two houses were here, and then across the street was the chapel. One of the things I remember so vividly and so fondly is old Dr. Carroll coming to the house. How many people have said that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. On his horse? In his horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. And invariably, it seems to me, no matter what was wrong with you, he would open his satchel and take out a bottle of pink medicine and pour it in a glass and that was your, <laughs> your cure-all. <laughs> but I, Dr. Carroll was a typical old doctor with his goatee, his white goatee. And then when he got a car, oh boy, you thought you were something when he came to see you. Uh, they talk about mass transportation today. When I lived in Dean's, you could get on a bus and go into New Brunswick four times a day. Every two hours, you could get a bus and go into New York or Philadelphia. You could walk to the station and get a train, I don't know, half a dozen times a day at least. Mm -hmm. In older days than that, you could walk up and get on the trolley and go into New, to New Brunswick, which we did often, because when we, when I was really young, we went to church in that town. We didn't come to St. Cecilia's. We came, started going to St. Cecilia's in 1926. So that was a nice, especially in the summertime, riding on the trolley was a lot of fun. Because the windows were open, you got all dusty, but it was all right. We started a library in Dean's School. 
I don't know where she got the books. She'd fill up her boxes and she'd bring them to Junction School. Mm -hmm. I guess she went there. Remember it well? Yeah. Uh, if you asked her, do you have so-and-so? Well, no, but I'll get it. And the next week when we went, she had it. My dad was tax collector in, the, in South Brunswick. In 1935, Mr. Bill Baker, and I believe it was Mr. Elmer Briggs, who was on the township committee, came and asked him if he would serve as tax collector because the former one had absconded with the funds. And my father was kind of hesitant. And my mother and I are standing in the kitchen going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, he accepted it, and after all, he was elected, and he served for 27 years. He was stricken at his desk. What else do I have here? Well, back in 1941, I married George Brabson from Mammoth Junction. We tossed a coin to see where we'd live, Deans or Mammoth Junction. Because <laughs> it was always competition, as Kiki can remember, and Charlie, between the ball teams, you know, so no matter, even <laughs> keeping company with him, I was always rooting for teams. Uh, so we were married in 41. Before that, George was in the first draft that went out of the Jamesburg draft board. Along with others from Junction, I think um, Bill Dasher, if I'm not mistaken, one of the Scarada boys, um, I don't know, I think that's all from the local. There were some from Plainsboro he knew too. It was rejected because of his eyesight. But after we were married a year and a half, they decided he could see well enough and they took him in the army for three and a half years. <laughs> uh, he was on limited service, so he never did serve overseas, but he served three and a half years as an airplane mechanic. In 1950, we started to build this house in the middle of a field. There was no road, and the first three lots were sold to George and I, Helen and Howard McWhorter, and the Flags. That was right after the war, and there were three veterans. And after that came everybody else. Who? Well, I think everybody but Jean was a veteran on the street. Uh, and I don't know, he, he was not in the service, I don't believe him. No. We started to build in 1950 with the help of Grandpa Brabson and Uncle John Brabson and cousins and friends and relatives. We built this house. And your father helped with the electricity. <laughs> George would do it, he'd come and inspect it. Okay, George, go ahead. <laughs> um, and that's Tony Santawasa. Tony Santawasa. Um, as I say, there was no road, and finally they did plow a dirt road down and put stones in it, and I, I forget just when they finally paved it, and it kind of caused a furor on Mammoth Junction because it had curbs. The first street in Mammoth Junction to have curbs. But let me tell you, They've only resurfaced it once in all these years. So it was done right. It was done correct. <laughs> and it was done right. Now an interesting point. I don't remember if we paid 200 or $400 for this lot. Today it is assessed at $68,500. So I, I don't know. Um, How many years would that be? Fifty. We bought the lot in uh, 47.